So we have our Laravel application up and running here. It's talking to a RDS database. We have the server up and running, but the last thing we talked about is using Redis. Now, I'm gonna log into the server here and I'm gonna change some environment stuff. And we're gonna change the session driver to use the Redis backed session driver here in Laravel and head back over here, refresh the page, and we'll see we get connection refused because the Redis stuff is trying to connect to by default here is localhost. Now we have our Redis instance running locally here. What we wanna do is use the managed service Elasticache, which allows us to create a Redis cluster or just a Redis instance. Okay, so a few things to know about Redis in Elasticache. Elasticache has a notion of clusters itself, but then Redis itself also came out with its own thing that it called clusters. So you can have an Elasticache cluster that are not Redis cluster. So here you see cluster mode enabled. That means using clusters within Redis. Inside of Elasticache, using cluster mode with Redis means you're doing some fancy database sharding where data gets sharded amongst clusters, multiple uh, separate clusters inside of your Redis instance here. In other words, there's multiple instances. Each one has its own little cluster and it shards some data amongst them. So that's fancier. And you're gonna have to research a little bit more about that if you wanna use it. For our use case, we absolutely do not need that complexity. So I'm gonna use regular old Redis here, not in cluster mode. It's Amazon Cloud. I want it to be managed on Amazon, not an on-premise instance. The name here, we're just gonna call it onboarding AWS Redis. I'll give it the same description. The most recent version of Redis we can get, the standard Redis port 6379. Uh, the default parameter group is fine here. I don't need to set any custom parameters here for Redis myself. Our node type here, they start us with a big one here. I'm gonna go down to T3 and choose a small one. I really have no need for much data for this video, but your real world use case might need more data here. What you wanna to do to check is if you already have and are using Redis, you can check how much memory you're using inside of that instance and base your instance size here based on that. You may also not wanna use a T3 or T2 type instance, so you avoid that CPU bursting, like we talked about with EC2 and RDS instances. Number of replicas. So I'm actually gonna do one, and I'm gonna do a multi-AZ setup here, and it's a little bit confusing here. A replica is a read replica. If you do multi-AZ, it'll also fall back to that replica when it needs to, but it's also gonna force your replicas to be in different availability zones, which means you're gonna incur extra bandwidth costs because it's gonna duplicate data across multiple availability zones. So I'm gonna do multi-AZ with just one replica. This means that it'll have a primary node and a secondary node, the replica, which will be a read node. And selecting the multi-AZ option will tell Elasticache to fall back to the read replica if it needs to. In other words, it promotes the replica to make it the primary subnet group. Now, we're gonna need a new subnet group here. Subnet group is gonna say which subnets Elasticache is allowed to create instances into. And notice it says with multi-AZ, you need at least two. So I'll just name it onboarding AWS subnet group. Description, I'll just do the same because why not? It's in our default VPC, which we've been using the whole time. And I have to recheck that because I changed this. No preference or select zones. Okay, so the primary one, I actually wanna be in the same zone as my instance here, which is in, let's see, US East 2C. So let's put our primary one in 2C as well to help save on bandwidth costs. And the replica can be in 2A. So when my EC2 server talks to the primary instance, it'll be in the same availability zone for the most part, and I won't have bandwidth costs there. But I will incur bandwidth costs when this duplicates data across our replica into the different availability zone. And if we fall back to our replica and make that the primary, or the multi-AZ setup does for us, if it falls back to the replica instance and makes that the primary, then we have extra bandwidth costs because my EC2 server in USC 2C is going to be talking to a Redis instance in USC 2A. So just know that you might incur some extra bandwidth costs there. It won't necessarily be a lot. It depends on how heavily you use your Redis instance. I'm going to not do any encryption here, but you could do some encryption at rest. It's just basically a checkbox to check where your disk drive for Redis is encrypted. Same thing with encryption in transit. It's basically like talking over an SSL certificate. You can check that box as well. And if you do that, you can use additional access controls if you'd like, things that are built under Redis or no access control at all. I won't choose any of those options right now, but you totally can. We have a slow log for slow queries if you want. You need to import data from S3, you can do that. An RDB file is a Redis uh, file that lives on the disk. It's where your Redis data is flushed to disk periodically if you have that enabled, which it is enabled here. 
enable automatic bucket once a day uh, for any backup window. You can select a backup window just like with RDS. I'll do no preference. Same thing with maintenance mode, exactly like RDS. There's a time when it will do maintenance, like um, minor version updates and all that good stuff. I have no preference in my case. I'll just give this a name. It'll be the same name as above, onboarding AWS Redis. Let's go ahead and create this. When that finishes creating, or rather when we load the next page, we see a status of creating, and we basically just have to wait for this to go ahead and do it. If we click down here, we'll see some details about it. The engine is obviously Redis and the version we selected and all that good stuff. We'll see there's fancier options like data tiering that we can dig into if we really would like to. Auto failover is enabling, right? This is part of that multi-AZ configuration. The number of shards in a Redis cluster if you use cluster mode, which we did not. And other good stuff. Now here, security group. One of the options was the security group. And actually, I might have skipped over it by accident, but it did ask what security group to put this instance into. Now remember, resources in AWS allow no traffic in, and you have to add a security group in order to allow some traffic in. So this security group applies to traffic coming into this Redis instance. So this security group is, I think, just the default that comes within this VPC. But let's go ahead and actually see what that is. I'll head over to VPC. We can go to security groups. And it's just the default security group. What does this one allow? For inbound rules, it allows in all traffic. So that is pretty open. I actually want to create a security group much like the MySQL internal SG here. So I'll create a new one. We'll call it Redis internal SG. Allows in Redis traffic on the private network. Within our default VPC here, we have some inbound and outbound rules. Now outbound rules, I'm just going to leave to allow all outbound traffic. We care about inbound here. So this doesn't have a default for Redis, but we remember that the port is actually this one, 6379. And we're going to allow traffic in from the private network address, right? The CIDR block here that represents the IP address range of our private network, of this VPC's private network. So this is going to allow in a TCP rule on port 6379 if the traffic is coming from somewhere on the private network. So let's go ahead and save this security group. And over here in Elasticash, we will want to modify it if we can. I don't think we can do that just yet until it finishes creating. So let's go ahead and let it finish creating, and then we can modify it so that it applies the security group that we want. Okay, so this has finished updating. It's available, and we have an endpoint we can use here to speak to the Redis instance. And of course, it's over 6379. Now, we also have a reader endpoint we can use because we created an extra node, right? We have two nodes, and they're in different availability zones, and we have multi-AZ enabled, so it will promote the reader node to the master node, making it the master node, during maintenance or if something goes wrong. So we can actually use the reader endpoint also if we wanted to, but primarily you're going to want to use the primary endpoint. Okay, but let's go back to the topic at hand. We need to modify this. And we can see right here we have security groups and we can edit which ones are related to this instance. So we're going to go ahead and select Redis internal SG, deselect the default and save that. And down here, we're going to apply immediately instead of have it apply during a maintenance period. And this is going to take a minute or two. So while it's happening, let's go ahead and copy and paste the primary endpoint. We'll head back over here and check out our Redis host and just paste that in. Now, there's no password here. We're not using any kind of authentication in our case, but it's still port 6379. And I'm going to save and quit this. And this actually might work because remember that security group was very open and allowed in all traffic, basically. So let's go ahead and pop over here and refresh. And we didn't get an error, which means it's using the Redis instance. Back over here, we'll see, and actually that finished modifying as well. So it's at that security group that we want, the new one that we created here. And our instance is able to use Redis for our sessions. And I'm able to log in, and it's using Redis for that session. Perfect. Okay. I'll just talk about things to monitor in this instance really quick. Uh, you're going to want to primarily monitor your primary instance. And there's really not much here to care about, except for the things that might be kind of obvious. Just like with your RDS instance and your EC2 instance, you'll want to keep an eye on CPU credit usage. Now, there's also database memory usage percentage. So you want to keep an eye on database memory usage percentage, because if it goes 100%, then you're out of memory. And Redis is a data store that lives in RAM, lives in the memory. So if you're using 100% of your memory, you're going to run into issues. Current connections is also important because you don't want to overrun your instance with too many connections. 
And there's other Redis specific things like evictions. If you run out of memory, they might start evicting old items, old keys in your Redis cache. There's also replication lag. Replication lag is what happens when the replica instance is lagging behind the primary instance. So this is the amount of lag in seconds. Okay, and that's all to care about here. There's really not too much disk stuff to care about. While the disk underlying this is used because Redis will flush data to the disk periodically, that is not a blocking mechanism typically. That causes slowdowns in Redis because Redis is really using its workload out of memory, out of RAM. So that's not all there is here to it, but that's really the main highlights of things to monitor when you're using a Redis instance.